Today we're off to Japan. I'm Chef Michelle Bernstein. Not only do we get cars, electronics, and Yoko Ono from Japan, we get good food too. Join me for a collated culinary collection of recipes from Japan today on SoFlo Taste. Welcome all to the Goya Kitchen at J World in Coconut Creek. I'm Chef Michelle Bernstein. When you think of Japanese food, do you only think of sushi? Well, if you do, keep watching. Today I thought it would be fun to give you some recipes for Japanese food that is much more than just putting something either on top of or inside of some rice. So let's get cooking. The first thing I want to teach you is tempura. I love tempura, something quickly fried in the most deliciously simple and crunchy batter. Ugh, heavenly. The first thing we're gonna do though is jump into the dipping sauce, which is called tensuyu. And it is a beautiful dipping sauce, very simple to make. All you need is a little pot with dashi broth, which is seaweed broth. By the way, they make instant dashi granules. You can put them in some water and have them at the ready. And they're delicious to put vegetables in and all kinds of dipping sauces. A little mirin which is sweet cooking wine made out of rice, and a little bit of soy sauce, which you can get light soy sauce, dark soy sauce, low sodium soy sauce. It's really up to you what you wanna use, what you have at home. We're gonna go ahead and let this boil to let all of the wine cook out of that mirin. And as soon as that is there and boiling, we're gonna shut it off. And then we're gonna add two things. One is grated daikon, very traditional in tensuyu. You can use as much or as little or as none as you wish into your dipping sauce. I love the flavor of daikon, which is, you know, like a spicy radish, and I'm just grating it on the microplane. And then if you want a little bit of grated ginger, which is also delicious, which you can do on a microplane like so. All right. Then we're gonna pour everything in there and we're gonna have a beautiful dipping sauce ready. Let's jump right into the tempura, which is the most important part of all of this. In here, I have some sifted all-purpose flour. You don't have to sift it, I just like to sift it just to make sure that I don't have any like, you know, hard particles of flour, you never know. It just makes things a little more fluid. I've got some ice cold water. I also have two egg yolks. So it's basically for every cup of ice water, it's one egg yolk and a cup of flour. So let's go ahead and beat these up a little bit. I'm gonna add some ice water to this. Mix this up again as I add it back into the ice water. Try to get every last bit of that egg yolk out of there. And then we're gonna pour that into the flour all at once. Now this doesn't have to be incredibly smooth. It's kind of like gravy. You know how you always have lumps in your gravy? Now it should look a little bit like paste. That should be the texture. And if it's a little too thick, you can always add a little ice water. And if it's a little thin, you can always add a little more flour. But whatever you do, just try not to whisk it up a little too much. All right, so you can tempura pretty much anything vegetables, meats, chickens, your favorite stuff. I've chosen today to use two things, a beautiful array of vegetables. We have sweet potatoes with a peel off. I even have a little bit of lotus found in an Asian market. Baby broccoli, asparagus, onions. I mean, let's face it, one of the best way to make a great onion ring is to tempura fry it. I've got some beautiful Japanese eggplant cut nice and thick. And then, of course, I have gorgeous shrimp. Thanks to my friends over at Delaware Chicken Farm and Seafood Market, I asked them for the biggest, most beautiful shrimp that they have. They are over at 4191 North State Road 7 in Hollywood. They not only have shrimp, obviously by their name, they have great chickens, turkeys, ducks, you name it, but their seafood is also gorgeous. So you could tempura some fish if you wanted to. Shrimp like I have today, look at these suckers. These are so beautiful. This is a six to seven per pound shrimp. It's absolutely gorgeous. Let me show you what I did to it though to make it nice and straight the way it is. You basically take it, they've already peeled and deveined it for me, but you flip it on the back side 
And then with a sharp little knife, you basically cut along the back of the shrimp, like so, just like four or five straight slices. And then you take a larger knife and then you kind of just bang it a little bit like so, and it straightens it out and then you're ready for frying. So look at the tempura. You see how it has little lumps in there? I'm perfectly fine with that. The only thing I'm making sure of is that the water and yolk are mixed in well. All right, so I want you to notice how neat everything is here. We've got our shrimp, we've got our vegetables, we have our flour for dusting, we have our tempura, and we have the oil. That essentially is the most important part of tempura frying is to have yourself organized. My dipping sauce is ready. I'm gonna let it cool and then pour it in there. And then over here, I have a little rack ready for all my fried goods to allow any excess grease to drip off. I have something to pick up my fried items, but I'm also gonna use some chopsticks for that too. I have a little glass to place my chopsticks into when I'm not busy working. This is called mise en place, this is organization, and this is how a good tempura works. You have to have a system. All right, so let's jump right into it. Let's start with maybe some shrimp and some shiitake mushroom. So I'm gonna dip, all right, dipping in. Our oil, by the way, is at about 360 right now. We're gonna place in there and start frying. Let's do a couple of these and let's add some shrimp in here too because I'm excited to see how the shrimp is gonna turn out. Look how beautiful this is. Check out this beautiful shrimp, it's just gorgeous. And thanks to the way that I cut it, it shouldn't curl too much. It should be really nice and long the way you see it in Japanese restaurants. Let's dip that in there and fry. All right, I'm gonna try to get through a lot of these vegetables while you're taking a little break on commercial and I'll see you back here and we will crunch into some tempura together and check out my dipping sauce. I cannot wait. There's still more from the Goya Kitchen at JA World and Michelle. SoFlo Home Project is next, right here on Local 10. Welcome back to SoFlo Taste. All of my recipes, including today's, are available on the SoFlo Show's webpage. Just scan this quick response code for immediate access to the fabulous SoFlo Show's page. You'll also see the QRC on the ingredients list throughout the show. So now, back to my Japanese cooking. All right, everybody, take a look at this gorgeous plate of tempura. And this dipping sauce is so if I may. Ridiculous. I'm going to taste the shiitake. Mmm. 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 So good. I'm going to put this on the side because I got a little surprise for you. One of the chefs that I work with happens to be the most amazing baker. He's so wonderful. He's been cooking with me for many years. He works back there helping Amanda a lot but I never get to have him on the show. Today, he's gonna teach me how to make one of my favorite breads. It's called Japanese milk bread. His name is Joel Culverio, and he's wonderful. Hey, Jojo. Hey, Chef. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure. I really appreciate it. Awesome. All right, tell me the Japanese name for Japanese milk bread. Uh, it's a Hokkaido bread. Um, it's origin, a lot of people really don't know, but it really comes from Taiwan, Taiwanese um, cooking. They activate the gluten <laughs> by cooking it to okay. 165 degrees. Okay. And what that does is it creates moisture in the bread, which gives it a longer shelf life. Go ahead and tell me what to do, because I'm going to start over here, right? Right, we're going to combine the milk and the water and the flour. We're going to whisk that. You're going to put the right. heat on milk, low. Water. Yep. Yep, and I'm going to go ahead over here. It's kind of like a roux, right? Correct. Okay, so I'm going to whisk it until what? What, what Am I looking for like a roux You're looking for texture? a nice thick texture. Okay. And then once you get that texture, yeah. you're going to cook it for about 30 seconds. Okay. Put it into the bowl, add the milk. Okay, and then whisk and it together? Yes. Okay. Right now we're combining the flour, the powdered dry milk, sugar, yeast, salt, I find it very interesting. You know, I love powdered dry milk. So that's one of the milks in the Japanese milk bread, and then I'm cooking the other milk, right? Correct, and then we're gonna it. also add more milk and add butter to the mix completely. Okay, I think I'm good. I think we're good. Yeah, check out the texture. You see that? So using a rubber spatula. Yes. I will put that into this bowl. Not missing anything. All right, so you said, Add 
the milk, yeah, this right? Is the a, cold milk? This is a baker's tip that I like okay. to use. Um, usually this is not in a method, but this cools down the tong jong, which um, speeds up the process. Usually Got it's supposed it. to be cooled down to room temperature. I'm gonna add the egg as well. Oh, okay. All right, honey, here you go. Thank you. So we're gonna go ahead and add the butter. So why does that butter look soft? Is it just softened butter or is it, have you melted or? I melted it and then let it get to room temperature. Okay. You wanna get, wanna make sure you get everything in there. And so I see that you're using a dough hook, right? Yeah, we're trying to slowly knead it for at least 10 to 15 minutes at okay. a low speed. All right, so once you do that, then what? So once it's been kneaded for about 15 minutes, okay. we're, uh, what I like to do is, the way I know that it's ready is I like to poke a hole. And once it goes inside like that, I know that it's ready. So next step is we're gonna remove it from the bowl here. Okay. And we wanna divide it into four Equal? pieces. Equal? Well, minus? more or less. What I like to do is uh, 170 grams. Okay. Wow, look at you, you're like right on. I don't think I could have done it better. <laughs> that's crazy. All right, that's fine. All right, so 170 grams each. Correct. What I like to do is, uh -huh. I like to form them all into like little, tiny little balls. Okay. You use your hands like that and cup them and just lightly, yeah. And just set them to the side. I used to be the hamburger roller at my first, uh, the restaurant, first restaurant I ever worked in, so I'm pretty good at <laughs> cupping and rolling. All right. And what I like to do is take my towel, okay. these three, and while that's happening over there, yep. I'm gonna flatten it with our hands, okay. dust it with a little bit of flour. Yeah. I like to get flour a little bit more than what you think. All right, look how beautiful that is though. That dough looks already just divino. Right. I also beautiful. like to flour a rolling pin. It helps for it not to stick. Now, we're not trying to roll it too much, just a little bit enough. So we can tuck it, uh, fold it like an envelope. Okay. And then we're gonna repeat this one more time. Okay. Very, very lightly again. And then we're gonna roll it. Kinda looks like a cinnamon bun. Yeah, and then what I like to do is get the ends and kinda pinch them. Okay. Here. And we're gonna place them. You can grease the pan if you like. Do you need to? Um, you don't have to if you have a nonstick, but if you don't have a nonstick, I always suggest you to lightly grease it. Okay, so you do, the rest of them are all like that. Correct. And then what, and then you let that rest for how long? That's gonna rest for another 50 minutes, and then- Five zero? Correct. Okay. And then afterwards- And what kind of temperature should it be resting in? You want a warm temperature for your bread to proof, but any room temperature in your house is fine. Once it's finished, before we bake it, mm -hmm. um, traditionally people add milk, and they brush a little bit of milk on it. Um, baker's tip, I like, if you want that golden brown, like like brioche, I like to do one egg and one uh, tablespoon of ice cold water. Okay. Brush Instead it lightly. Instead of the milk. Instead of the milk. Okay. That's how I get that nice golden bread, uh, golden color. How long does that bake for? It's gonna bake for about 30 to 35 minutes. I always like to check it at uh, 25 minutes. Oh, wow. This is beautiful. So, as you all can see, it's the four separate. Why are these a little taller? Why does that um, happen? Sometimes there are air, po air pockets that happen. Okay. Um, it's the imperfection of the bread Which and I the love. ends. Yeah. But the, it looks the, like it's meant to be, by the way. So yes. don't say imperfection. <laughs> to me, it's pretty perfect. Thank you, Chef. So can I just rip into it? That, is that's that okay? the point. Yeah, okay. that's, yeah, there you go. Wow. This is just, it's so soft and so subtle. Right. Mmm. This smells like brioche. Right. It's beautiful. Oh, and you can peel, and you can see right here how you can peel. Yeah. And that's how you know. I don't eat flour, but I have to try it. It's so it's good. It's really good. Mm. Thank this you, is perfect. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, Joel. You're the best. It's a pleasure. Mm. You guys have to try this. Another recipe in a moment. Come right back. Tuned to SoFlo Taste. We'll be right back. Welcome back to SoFlo Taste. 
as I am most every week, I am coming to you from the incredible J World. It's a great educational venue for our kids. For more JA World information, visit jasouthflorida.org or call them 954-979-7100. Now back to something good from Japan, and I don't mean Alexis. I would love to teach you my last recipe, which is really refreshing and delicious. If it's stone crab season, use stone crab. If not, head over to those friends I was telling you about earlier at Delaware Chicken Farm Seafood Market because they have my husband's favorite, Alaskan king crab, and they are big and juicy and delicious, and they will cut them up for you, which is even better. They're a pain, honestly, to cut. They're kind of hard, um, but they're delicious and yummy. They're a little bit salty, and so what I'm making today is gonna be perfect for them. We are making a recipe of sunomono. It's basically just mean that something has vinegar on it. Not necessarily pickled, just vinegared. So if you call those folks at um, Delaware Chicken Farmer Seafood Market, or just go online at DelawareChicken.com, you can look at all the stuff that they carry. You're gonna get dizzy from it. Um, anyway, let's get into sunomono and the sauce. We're gonna use that dashi, that seaweed broth that I told you about earlier, because that is the base of this sauce. And again, it's gonna get heated so that everything melts, but we're not gonna get it too hot. All right, starting with a little dashi. And by the way, this vinaigrette is called sambaizu. There's a lot of different types of vinegar recipes in the Japanese book of recipes. And this one is a four ingredient vinegar. There are some that are seven, uh, some that are three. There's a lot of different types, but this is the specific one that goes with tsunomono. A little bit of rice wine vinegar, and finally sugar. And the only reason why we're really heating all this up is for that sugar to melt. So I'm just gonna mix that together until it does. And it shouldn't take but a couple seconds. All right, I think we're there. So I'm gonna set that aside and let it cool off for just a couple minutes. Next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna just add a couple of ingredients, but this crab is so pristine and so perfect. I don't wanna add too much. The one thing I went without today is um, a chili. I think that a lot of people would love this to be a little spicy but I do love the flavor of king crab, and so I wasn't gonna put a chili in it today just so that the crab is the star. But if you want it to be a little spicy, absolutely go ahead. All right, so normally you would find little moons um, when you eat a sunomono, but because this is a European cucumber, I don't really have to cut the seeds out. Let's go ahead and just cut the tip of the cuke. This is a Japanese mandolin. I use them all the time on the show. I love them, and it is my little cheat way to cut things very, very, very thin. We're gonna go with the whole cuke for this because we have a lot of crab in this bowl. Go ahead and add that in. And then the only thing I have to top this off is a little bit of scallion. So we have these beautiful green onions. Normally for garnish, people use the green, but I'm gonna actually use the white part. So let's take a few of these and slice them nice and thin. Little rounds so that we have a little texture. So there we go. So let's go ahead and build this. We have our beautiful dressing right here. Remember, it does have sugar, there's no salt. Again, there is soy, which has sodium, but it's not a salty sauce because our king crab does have a lot of the saltiness from, they probably cook it in a lot of salt water. So let's mix this together. Try not to break up that king crab too much because when you're serving it, you don't want it to just look like you opened up a can of crab meat, right? You want it to look like what it is which is this beautiful legs of king crab. They're just gorgeous. All right, so using my chopsticks so I don't offend that crab any further, I'm just gonna go ahead and place some pieces of this gorgeous leg. Oh, look how beautiful that is. Some of the cucumber, and what a perfect way to show off the integrity of the crab and its beautiful natural flavor with a sunomono. It's a simple vinaigrette. By the way, once this cools, you place it in your fridge indefinitely. I mean, I don't see anything that would go bad in there, to be honest with you. So 
Keep it as long as you want in your fridge. Use it on anything that might be of season. Let's top it off with just a little extra sauce right over the top of it. This would be where I would hit it with olive oil as a more Western type of a cook. But I think that this works beautifully. A little scallion, and there we have it. Perfect crab cinnamono. Thank you to that Alaskan crab that gave yourself up for us. It's beautiful. Come right back, please. SoFlo Taste will return right after this. Well, how'd you like my SoFlo Taste Tour of Japan's food? And these recipes to your list of global goodies. Time to say good morning to Elena Capra, host of SoFlo Home Project. Morning, Elena. What's next on SoFlo Home Project? Hi, Michelle. Good morning. So today we have some great ways to liven up your home decor with floral arrangements. Coming up on SoFlo Home Project, we share expert advice on creating beautiful arrangements in honor of Mother's Day. Well, we will stay right where we are, dear. So Taste Buds, thanks for watching, and I'll see you all next Saturday at 1030. Goodbye, mwah, and good taste.